Well, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Alejandro. You know, the, uh, the ILO, the International Labour Organization, was set up uh, in 1919, um, primarily as a body to produce international labour standards. In the process, it has become clear that standard setting work presumes research, statistics, policy, expert discussions, training and technical assistance and cooperation. However, any such action has to be underpinned by clear standards. Almost in any resolution or declaration that we see these days, we see regular references to gender, race, religion, ethnic origin, status, migrants, refugees, health and disability, sexual orientation, and age. However, with the notable exception of the lower age bracket, children and youth, uh, the references to age are seldom followed up by concrete normative action. The Universal Declaration on Human Rights does not mention age, neither does the ILO's uh, Discrimination Convention, number 111. This no doubt is also due to the demographics of the late 1940s and 1950s. Age starts to feature increasingly in discussions and instruments when we come to the current century. But while age is not mentioned in uh, all instruments, it is generally accepted to be associated with serious and widespread uh, discrimination. The WHO has noted that uh, discrimination on the basis of age may be a more extensive and pervasive phenomenon than those of racism or sexism, which both have generated and continue to generate a lot of activity, including standard setting. What would be the aim of a standard? Firstly, there is a void to be filled. We have specific dedicated instruments and follow-up mechanisms on gender, disability, racism, ethnic origins, migration, and in the question of age, youth. Starting with the standards of minimum age to employment and policies to deal with uh, youth uh, employment. We have quite specific instruments on the transition of younger persons into employment a week ago, uh, the UN Summit for the Future also suggested a new standard for promoting young people, an equivalent approach to the exit from full-time work, is not there. We have a general understanding of the costs of aging in different forms, and we have numerous institutional arrangements, mostly related to the effects of degrading health. But we lack a proper analysis on the economic and social effects of aging throughout the human life cycle. It is generally accepted that there is a link between old age, poverty, and the obstacles to achieving sustainable development goals. For a variety of reasons, much of the issues of aging still remain invisible or only partially understood. We have no international legal benchmark or underpinning for eliminating the stereotypical attitudes and consequent action on older age. Arguments against the standard can also be made. The definition of ageism and old age is elusive. But is it really more vague than that of other more established rights? One could also argue that it would be better to first try to work on attitudes before moving to standards. This is an argument you often hear. But the truth of human rights law and practice is that attitudes do not change if they are not underpinned by a standard. 
and this is the experience of the ILO. It seems to me that the objective of a new standard is clear enough. Firstly, aiming at low-end policies, that is what the state can do with its powers. Specific issues are long-term and palliative care. Besides physical institutions, the case can be made for such arrangements as ombudsmen or other special bodies and procedures with also effective redress possibilities. The participation of aged persons in both collective and individual decisions concerning them is imperative. Facilitating the participation of older people in elections, for instance, is a key issue of democracy itself. In the case of aging, it is necessary also to go much deep, deeper than the institutional dimension. Not only the interpersonal or social dimension, but also the internal effects of older age on people themselves need to be reached in one way or another. The obstacles to access to care can be social attitudes, access to technology, communication, which increasingly govern the provision of health care, and simply a lack of encouragement that age is not a fatality which limits personal decision-making ability and rights. While the minimum age to employment can roughly be quantified, maximum age cannot. This part of legislation and policy has to be seen together with policies on pensions and other social benefits, starting with the need to guarantee a sufficient minimum income after full active working life. Provision should also be made for emergencies such as pandemics, armed conflicts, internal displacement and refugees on the principle of no one should be left behind. A standard should include also parameters for information and research, but most importantly, it should spell out obligations and methods of supervision by treaty bodies <clears throat> with inputs through reporting mechanisms, including complaints, with rules on who is empowered to bring up an issue <coughs> and how it will be treated. A standard without follow-up is not much more than pious wishes. Just to conclude, <coughs> I would like to note um, that it's important to reflect how to proceed towards a standard. Well, experience has shown that someone needs to produce a draft. Otherwise, the discussion is abstract and goes in circles. And please remember, there always is much power in a first draft. Thank you.